Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, welcome to this day zero event, Protecting Public Health Online, Shadow Regulation and Access to Medicines. My name is Ron Andruff. I'm a long time ICANite, and uh, so it's nice to see my ICANN friends in here and also IGF friends and people who have not, not yet met, but I'm thankful that you're here to hear this conversation today. Uh, we have with us today Dr. Arya Ilyad Ahmad, a Global Health Foresighting Fellow and former policy advisor of the Dadele Institute for Global Health Research at York University, who will be presenting his discussion paper entitled Digital Governance of Public Health Towards a Regulatory Framework for Internet Pharmacies. And hard copies of this discussion paper are here on the front. If you would care to pick one up after the session, you're more than welcome if you'd like one now also. Um, and if you want one electronically, leave me your card and I will be sure to send you an electronic copy. Ten years ago, at uh, Sharm El Sheikh IGF, the sale of medicines over the internet was first brought to this forum. And while significant progress has been made in the development of safety protocols, very little progress has been made regarding addressing a harmonized set of norms, rules, and laws that allow for safe distance dispensing. Until now. Now we are undertaking a multi-stakeholder approach to resolving this growing public health moral hazard. Dr. Ahmad has been working in the field of falsified medicines with the United Nations and others for the past 12 years and brings a unique view to this discussion. And while this initial scoping review uh, addresses studies and efficacies and quality of online pharmacies, mainly in North America, it also touches on uh, European Union regulation and legislation, and clearly these issues are as much an Asian and Global South problem as well. So what is the issue? Well, there are several, but the key ones are information asymmetry and hybrid regulatory regimes, which can be categorized as shadow regulation. But most importantly, this is about people. It's about real people in real circumstances, and it's a people issue with lots of complexity and certain players who make the rules that we, the people, must live with. The Internet and Jurisdiction Global Status Report 2019 that will be discussed here this week notes that 50 years after the creation of the Internet, there is strong evidence of a dangerous trend the worldwide multiplication of public and private policy initiatives in an uncoordinated manner will have detrimental consequences. Even when legitimately aim aimed to address key transnational issues, adoption of quick fix measures under the pressure of urgency often leads to a legal arms race and additional conflicts. Online pharmacies, as are described, defined as websites that market and sell prescription medicines over the internet that is dispensed by mail order. And it began operating in about the mid-1990s. In North America, this issue of purchasing medicines outside of, one, outside of one's own country gained public attention through media coverage of bus trips which brought seniors up to Canada to buy medicines and were sometimes sponsored by U.S. politicians who were supportive of, re of reforming drug importation laws. Some Canadian pharmacies later began par partnering with licensed pharmacies in other countries, such as Australia, New Zealand, and the U.K., and later India and Turkey as well, in, and those in free trade zones. High drug prices is one of the main reasons that Americans go online to buy medicines. And the Center for Disease Control has advised that about 5 million Americans buy medicines internationally each year due to these high domestic prices. In fact, millions have safely imported medicines ordered online pursuant to valid prescriptions for their own use. As evidenced in Dr. Ahmad's discussion paper, it's not the violation of federal or state laws that threaten public health. Rather, the actions of rogue pharmacy operators who sell fake or otherwise dangerous medicines or real medicines without, the without a proper prescription. This session, along with our Thursday workshop in Sal Europa at 11.45, where we'll have a larger panel to discuss this topic, are designed to inform the discussion and debate through addressing the following. 
The appropriate and proportional regulation of internet pharmacies requires balancing public health while ensuring consumer safety and choice as enumerated in the Brussels principles for the sale of medicines over the internet. Can the multi-stakeholder approach that led to the Brussels principles serve as a model for developing standards and best practices to ensure access to safe medicines over the internet? Two, global problems cannot be addressed by national law. Meanwhile, the Internet and Jurisdiction Global Status Report highlights deficits in international coordination to address cross-border legal and regulatory challenges associated with the Internet. So what is the most appropriate transnational forum for inclusively and transparently addressing the digital governance and public health issues associated with online pharmacies? Three, internet intermediaries have emerged as key actors in digital governance. With respect to internet pharmacies, this has led to a number of technical and policy approaches aimed at balancing public health and consumer choice. What are the opportunities and challenges associated with digital governance approaches regulating internet pharmacies, including dot pharmacy top level domain and trusted notifier systems? While the internet has enabled millions of people to find safe and lower cost medicines, it has also created a public health minefield where dangerous websites posing as safe pharmacies are accessed every day. And such websites sell fake, adulterated, and or low quality medication uh, or safe and prescription drugs, but again, without prescription. And these rogue online pharmacies are a serious global threat to patient safety, which to those who oppose on online pharmacies are quick to employ in their scare tactics. What is needed is a definition of rogue online pharmacy that focuses strictly on public health considerations rather than technical restrictions on personal drug importation. Those online pharmacies in the business of selling genuine medicines dispensed by a licensed pharmacy and pharmacist that require a patient's prescription should not be considered rogue. In stark contrast, criminals in the business of intentionally selling fake, spurious, and adulterated medicines online are, in fact, rogue. The political debate about drug importation has created a false dichotomy. Those who favor legalizing the importation and those who oppose it. Yet the fact remains that most active pharmaceutical ingredients found in local U.S. pharmacy prescriptions were manufactured overseas. It's critical that action be taken to protect, protect patients' health. Lawmakers must be educated on the issues and pass legislation to remove criminal penalties, even if those criminal penalties are never enforced, that can be applied to individuals who import small quantities of medicines for their own use, and such laws are inimical to our basic right of life and liberty. Creating a rational but expedited system of obtaining court orders to shut down rogue pharmacies, something being considered within the ICAM community with its trusted notifier program, will undoubtedly provide a pathway that respects due process of law, internet freedom, and access to affordable medicine. But there are other issues. The National Association of Boards of Pharmacy, a United States trade organization, is the registry operator for the dot pharmacy domain name. As such, it holds the right to unilaterally establish policies around this global good by virtue of its contract with ICANN. Dot pharmacy designates online pharmacies that are based outside of the United States as not recommended and will not grant them a dot pharmacy domain name regardless of their safety credentials. This mis misleading classification blurs the lines between dangerous rogue pharmacy practices and safe international pharmacy services. Search engines, domain registrars, credit card companies, and payment processors have the ability to shut down or more significantly curtail access to dangerous rogue online pharmacies or any company operating online in that field by prohibiting service to them. They're sometimes referred to as gatekeepers. Unfortunately, such gatekeepers' actions have overreached the effect to affect safe international on online pharmacies. So safe international online pharmacies being banned from advertising on major search engines are having difficulty finding credit card processing due to new online pharmacy restrictions, and some have their domains actually locked by registrars. <laughs> 
This is leading to the discussion on shadow regulation. We clearly need new norms, new rules that address our 21st century needs. As explained in the INJ policy network, the task lies before us all. The task that lies before us all demands governance innovation. It involves developing the standards for legal interoperability and policy coordination so that we are equipped with methods and tools that are as transnationally, transnational, distributed, scalable, and resilient as the internet itself. What is at stake is nothing less than the future of the digital society that we collectively want for us and for future generations. Tim Berners-Lee, in his remarks regarding the creation of an internet contract from earlier today, noted that making sure the fundamental attributes of the internet are preserved requires active steps in the form of innovation, coordination, and cooperation efforts from all of us to achieve a safe and empowering internet. This is what we hope these sessions on public health online will bring us to. Since 2014, Dr. Arya Ilyadikmad has served as a consultant to the World Health Organization's Department of Essential Medicines and Health Products, where his work addressed issues of medicine safety and vigilance. He is a faculty member of the Global Health Education Initiative at the University of Toronto and past Duke University Global Health Fellow. He has testified before the Canadian Senate on Canada's access to medicines regime, served on boards of directors of universities allied for essential medicines, and was the inaugural Médecins Sans Frontières Access to Medicines Fellow in India. He received his H HBSC and MSc in Pharmaceutical Sciences from the University of Toronto and his PhD in Global Health Governance at the Basili School of International Affairs in Waterloo, Canada. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you today to Dr. Arya Ilya Ahmad. The floor is yours, sir. Um, thank you uh, for those introductory remarks, uh, Ron, uh, both for setting uh, the stage uh, in a sense and also your very kind introduction. Um, so I will admit this is my first time at an IGF uh, conference, uh, and so I thought it was only appropriate that I uh, introduce myself uh, and why a global health governance person sort of uh, became interested in, in this particular issue. Um, and because I'm a professor, uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll ask you, uh, make it a little more engaging and ask you, um, for those who can see, um, what, what, what is that? You can, you can yell it out. Not candy. Not candy. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's an aerial shot, um, and that's a Chinese customs uh, agent, uh, and he's walking over millions and millions of boxes of medicines that were seized uh, because they were suspected to be falsified or substandard, so they were unsafe. Uh, this is a problem that I've spent the last 10, 15 years uh, looking at, the issue of, of drug safety and drug quality, particularly uh, within complex supply chains and uh, within um, uh, how you address these issues, in a sense, within international governance uh, fora. Um, and so in addition to uh, uh, studying this issue uh, extensively, uh, as Ron said, I've, I've spent the last uh, few years also working with the World Health Organization, uh, where some of the things uh, we did uh, was for the first time uh, ever publish uh, uh, an estimate of how big of a problem this really is across regions, uh, because the problem is so complex, trying to understand it. Um, and also uh, helping establish a global surveillance and monitoring system uh, for, for providing countries uh, and, and sub-national jurisdictions an ability uh, to submit uh, potential uh, challenges. Now, inherent within the problem that I address is a number of different competing interests. Uh, and you can see that even just by this particular picture. Uh, there is obviously the issue of public health. Uh, there is issues of socioeconomic impact. Um, there is, it's a global problem uh, that requires uh, being able to measure how big of a problem this is. Um, there is a need for, for international and cross-border uh, uh, collaboration around issues of surveillance and monitoring. Uh, and of course, there is a need for uh, inter, or there is on this particular issue uh, a need for intergovernmental uh, organizations like the WHO uh, in the back to, to uh, help uh, deal with this issue. And largely, uh, this really comes down to um, uh, regulation, is, is how do we regulate this issue and who are the stakeholders uh, that participate? And that really fundamentally comes down to a process of making rules, rules, uh, rules uh, that provide uh, eventually standards and best practices. 
Now, inherent in, in that process of rulemaking uh, are a number of different components. Uh, who makes the rules and who does it impact? Um, why are those rules made? What are the norms and values and interests? Sometimes they're norms, sometimes they're competing interests, sometimes it's public health, sometimes it's, it's, it's commercial. Um, where does this happen and both where is where are these rules being made and also where do they apply? Um, how, what are the processes, what are the various uh, regulatory approaches that are being taken, uh, and ultimately what uh, uh, ends up uh, uh, in, in, in the rulemaking. And of course, inherent in that, and in, in where I uh, spent uh, a lot of time is, is, is looking at this issue uh, at the UN and intergovernmental um, level. Now, just to, uh, as a sort of uh, uh, additional element of, of sort of introduction, just to sort of make sure I sort of understand this particular crowd as well, uh, is, is I, at least for my uh, scoping uh, reading over the last couple of years on this particular issue, uh, found this particular agenda uh, uh, interesting. And I, I imagine it's not very obscure uh, because in many ways it led to why we are here uh, as well. Uh, and so in 2005, at the second World Summit of the Information Society, uh, the, the uh, Tunis agenda for the Information Society uh, was, was published. And the way I understand it, it, it provided us really with three particular things. Uh, one is, is a really sort of a, 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 a progressive uh, uh, conceptualization of what internet governance really is. Uh, and, and I'll read it, uh, I'll apologize, but it's the development and application by both governments, so states, the private sector, as well as civil society in the respective roles of shared principles, norms, rules, decision-making procedures, and programs that shape the evolution and use of the internet. Uh, so that's, that's quite comprehensive. Uh, it, it invokes a number of different stakeholders, uh, and it touches on uh, both the process by which you do this and the fact that there is a need for shared principles, shared norms, uh, and shared decision-making uh, processes. Uh, but, and the second sort of contribution of the Tunis Agenda uh, is, is establishing a particular forum to do that. Um, and that's the IGF, and I think we're in the 14th year of the IGF, um, and the, the, the goal, uh, at least the way I understood it, is, is to enable a, a forum for enhanced cooperation uh, between these different stakeholders, and it, 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 it shifts that conversation, not just limited to states, but also across different actors as well. Um, uh, civil society, private sector, technical governance, internet governance uh, communities, uh, and um, uh, uh, global advisory uh, uh, members of, of, of states states and substates as well. And so uh, that's sort of uh, the, 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 the basis on which um, uh, 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 where internet governance or uh, that I'll be discussing uh, are, are, are based on. Now at the same time this summer, uh, this really interesting uh, report uh, uh, sort of arrived. This is another uh, group, um, uh, the Internet and Juris Jurisdiction Policy Network uh, that published this uh, global status report uh, uh, this year. And, uh, and the way I read it, there was sort of a number of different considerations and I think a number of different challenges it raises. Um, the method of the process, uh, and again, I, I enjoyed it because it was, it was written by a, a fellow or at least had the contribution of a fellow academic, uh, was, a, was a very extensive interview process of over 200 key informants in the internet governance space uh, just to get a pulse of, of where they think we are 15 years after uh, the Tunis agenda. Uh, and really, it, it starts with sort of this, this, these considerations technologically that increasingly there is this unification of both the online and the physical world. Uh, and uh, this has a number of very broad regulatory and jurisdictional implications. Uh, and uh, recognizing that oftentimes we just adapt what we have physically into um, uh, digital governance, uh, that that can create challenges, particularly uh, because of that jurisdictional uh, issue uh, that the internet, of course, um, uh, uh, it sometimes sort of circumvents. Uh, now, Talking about some of those regulatory considerations, um, the stakeholders that were that were engaged, uh, the the argue the, the the point they were making is that um, uh, regulation is not a matter of if around internet issues, uh, but how we do it. Uh, so questions of uh, the regulation of uh, the internet versus regulation on the internet. Uh, so things like, for example, content management, uh, the role of self-governance, for example, um, as well as uh, and, and self-regulation, uh, including, for example, these hybrid organizations like ICANN that provide particular uh, technical uh, advice. 
and that there are now increasingly uh, a number of different internet intermediaries. Uh, and intermediaries, I mean, occur in, in, in a lot of different uh, spaces as well, but internet intermediaries specifically that are taking on f uh, fundamental sort of regulatory roles as well, uh, either formally or, or informally. Um, and lastly, these, these jurisdictional considerations, the fact that, as Ron uh, mentioned, uh, global problems can't be uh, always addressed by national law. Uh, and one of the, the, the starkest conclusions um, uh, from the 200 stakeholders was that four of those five, so 80% of those 200 plus experts, uh, uh, stated that it was, there was insufficient international coordination uh, to address cross-border legal challenges uh, on the internet. And so within this, understanding of some of the internet, contemporary internet governance challenges, uh, and, and, and both by background, uh, I thought it was quite interesting to, to, to tackle uh, this issue uh, at, at the intersection of um, uh, my work in, in global health and, and pharmaceutical access and uh, supply chain issues and, and safety um, and uh, public health, but uh, also in, in sort of this digital um, uh, governance uh, domain. Um, so I, the, the papers, as Ron mentioned, are, are, are here, they're available for you. Um, and I, I urge you to, 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 to uh, I'm really looking forward to, to both today and on Thursday uh, and also uh, offline um, uh, getting um, uh, comments and feedback from, from, from what I can see is, is sort of a very diverse uh, uh, range of stakeholders. Uh, but that, in a sense, is, is what this, this particular case study is, is attempting uh, to, to tackle, is this idea of how do you move towards a regulatory framework uh, around internet pharmacies where you balance issues of public health, uh, consumer safety, uh, as well as consumer choice. Now, what are we talking about when I talk about supply chain? This is a... a, a, a a simplified uh, uh, supply chain map, uh, but even more simple just for our sake, uh, is, is, is this idea, is that pharmaceutical manufacturers produce uh, drugs, uh, that makes its way to wholesalers and distributors, uh, that then makes its way to pharmacies, hospitals, uh, uh, other um, uh, health uh, professional vendors, uh, and ultimately gets to patients. So this is the way we sort of understood uh, uh, the pharmacy practice and, and, and medicine practice for, uh, for, for uh, centuries. Um, what is made more complicated by uh, the internet, or what's also been, been made sort of uh, both complicated but also um, uh, facilitated that particular process is, is this digital marketplace uh, that increasingly uh, is, is absorbing new markets and new particular areas uh, where it can take advantage of some of the benefits of a digital marketplace. Uh, issues of, of price competition, issues of being able to access products from different markets that you don't have access to, uh, and um, uh, the convenience, of course, the privacy, all, all those aspects. And so, uh, again, just uh, uh, when we're talking about uh, uh, online pharmacy, uh, a, a simplified schematic is this, is, is the customer uh, goes online, they search for a particular medicine, they have a prescription for that medicine. Um, they uh, then uh, uh, place an order, uh, the uh, owner uh, or pharmacist uh, owner um, uh, will then procure or have procured those particular uh, medicines, will review the prescription, uh, will make sure that it's appropriate for that particular uh, patient, uh, will process uh, the order uh, and then uh, ship uh, the, the, the product to uh, the, the patient uh, and use shipping companies, of course, to, to, to ship the product to the patient. Um, and inherent in all of this, there's, there's a number of different, of course, um, uh, safety steps to, to, to make sure uh, that, uh, uh, that that happens. So this, in a way, is sort of a simplified uh, uh, diagram of, of, of what uh, the, the process is, and the idea is that it, it allows the customer to, to be able to purchase um, uh, products at either lower price or from uh, different jurisdictions that, that, that it's, it's more convenient. Um, and there are, as you see, a number of different stakeholders that are involved as well. And largely, they are in that uh, internet intermediary space. We're talking about payment providers, uh, we're talking about search engines that allow uh, the patient to find uh, these products. We're talking about, obviously, uh, DNS and ISPs that allow those websites to operate. Uh, there are shipping companies that, that do the shipping. Um, uh, so, so there is these, these new actors that have, that have moved into uh, or, or that participate in this particular space. Now, why would patients uh, use this particular system? It sounds uh, like it's complicated. Uh, in, a, in a paper uh, a few years ago, um, uh, in trying to understand, uh, uh, surveying basically respondents and why they use it, um, 
the, what was remarkable is, 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 is this particular paper that's at 64% uh, or, or sorry, 41% uh, of, of, of those uh, users use cost as a major issue uh, uh, for, for why they use it. Uh, and what were we talking about when we're talking about cost? Um, uh, there was one uh, interesting study um, that looked at the top 100 uh, drugs in the, in the US uh, Medicare system. Uh, and uh, of the 76 that they were able to uh, purchase 76 of, of, of those, uh, the average cost saving for those particular products was, was about 72% cheaper. Uh, so it's not just 10, 15% cheaper, which you sometimes get uh, with um, uh, sort of online markets uh, to be able to sort of get things a little cheaper. We're talking about significant uh, cost reductions. But at the same time, uh, there are also, uh, uh, to, to address the, the, the safety issues, as I said, there's a number of different steps that a lot of these uh, online pharmacies have put in place, uh, and I'll, I'll get to them in a second, but um, just to give you sort of the, 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 the conclusion of that, uh, there was this uh, uh, article that came out earlier this year that basically said uh, when online pharmacies are credentialed, uh, when they have a number of uh, steps that they t put in place to make sure uh, that they protect uh, uh, consumer health, that um, the, the products from those sort of uh, uh, credential online pharmacies are so safe that peer review publications are no longer interested in the results that basically say online pharmacies can be safe. Uh, and so this is, uh, 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 is, is, is the basically arguing that it's, it's possible and, and through credentialing uh, you, can, uh, you can address the, the, the safety issue. Now, so these are some of the issues or, or some of the reasons why people uh, go towards um, online pharmacies. But at the same time, there are certain challenges uh, as well um, that, that shape the regulation of this particular space. So in the first instance, in, in that uh, particular report, the WHO, we, I mean, it's a simplified diagram again, but, but increasingly there is a globalization of the pharmaceutical supply chain. So you have manufacturers, wholesalers, central uh, uh, drug stores and procurers that are increasingly global. And this is not just for internet pharmacies, this is with, within the, the existing drug supply chain as well. Is, is this is a, a, a problem that's in the last really 30, 40 years has become uh, um, uh, more and more prevalent. And uh, this in part is because you have particular, and this is sort of basic economics, you have particular regions that are better at able to produce, for example, active pharmaceutical ingredients at large volumes at a much lower cost ensuring safety uh, standards that then provide either those raw ingredients or the finished products to um, uh, different markets. So in Europe, uh, whether you're talking about the US, whether you're talking about any uh, high income uh, country, uh, a, a majority, uh, it varies, but between 50 to 80% of all, they're either raw ingredients or finished products or imported from uh, abroad. But with this increased globalization of the supply chain, um, you have uh, the potential of for potential vulnerabilities. So uh, you have, uh, so this was a, 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 a government, uh, governmental oversight committee report, in, again in the US, uh, sorry, governmental accountability office in the US that, that a few years ago uh, did, a, did a, a study uh, focusing particularly around the sort of criminal aspect of, of, of uh, online pharmacies. And, and part of the argument uh, there is that increasingly because you have all these new intermediaries, you have payment processors, you have intraday intermediaries, you have where the drugs are coming from, there is vulnerabilities that can lead to uh, public health issues, consumer safety uh, issues. Now, the, the fact that these are possibilities, uh, we don't know how extensive this is, uh, despite uh, figures that people are putting out. Uh, the fact that this is possible uh, in many ways has led to uh, a, a, a very restrictive uh, uh, regime around uh, online pharmacies, uh, where uh, increasingly it's becoming uh, far more um, uh, uh, particular on, on or, or a very particular definition of what constitutes uh, an appropriate and legitimate uh, online pharmacy. Um, now, the argument that, in, in, in a sense, the paper uh, advances is uh, that this, in in a sense doesn't address either the consumer safety or consumer choice or the public health uh, uh, angle uh, of this. And, and there are really sort of four reasons why it doesn't, uh, this kind of sort of banning the problem and trying to push it away and pretend like it's not there. Um, Number one uh, is, is we have a serious drug access gap. Um, and so uh, this figure from the Access Medicines Foundation uh, in the Netherlands um, uh, of 
the, the, the seven or so billion people in the world, about two billion people don't have regular access to essential medicines. So we're talking about life-saving medicines, don't have access. So that figure is about one in three uh, people around the world. Uh, and as you can imagine, that figure is significantly higher uh, in low middle income countries, uh, where uh, in, in parts of uh, the global south, it's upwards of one in two uh, or, or, or two in three. Um, now, while it's an issue that's most prevalent in uh, the Global South, uh, this was uh, a, a, an issue of the American Association of Retired Persons, the largest uh, uh, civil society organization in, in, in the US uh, with about 50 odd million members. Um, but they put out this report, and of course, as you imagine, they would be really concerned about issues of cost as well, and, and, and costs and access oftentimes are, are, are quite intricately linked. Um, that report uh, put out this interesting statistic that in those 10 years, nine year period of time, uh, the cost for the most popular brand name drugs has gone up 208%. Uh, now when costs go up or when out of pocket spending particularly goes up, uh, it not only has an effect on, um, uh, the, the, uh, on, on impoverishing uh, impact, uh, but it can also lead to, to medical non-adherence. So it can lead to people not actually taking the drugs uh, that they are prescribed. And this is uh, an incredible problem, particularly among vulnerable populations, uh, whether we're talking about uh, populations in uh, low middle income countries or seniors, for example, or people that have chronic diseases and they're on, like seniors, for example, I think after the age of 60, you're on average of five drugs or more. Um, Imagine if your copay for each of those prescriptions was $1,000, for example, or $500. Uh, cost increasingly becomes a barrier to access, uh, and that leads to what in the medical community is called medical non-adherence, is you're not taking the prescriptions that you were supposed to. Uh, and the problem is quite severe. It's, it's been estimated, it's wide estimates, but it's uh, just in the US, it's about $100 to $300 billion in additional healthcare costs because of medical uh, non-adherence. Uh, so access is a major issue, so cost uh, is a major issue, and uh, as we've, we've seen, online pharmacies can potentially address elements of that cost question. Uh, so from a public health perspective, uh, it doesn't uh, make a, a lot of sense. Um, number two is that none of this is new, uh, in a sense. Uh, the cross-border aspect of uh, online, of, of, of uh, medicine uh, transportation. Uh, as I showed, the, the, the supply chain is largely uh, global, uh, but also there are mechanisms in place for countries to be able to purchase from other countries for, to be able to import uh, drugs. So uh, under the World Trade Organization rules, the TRIPS agreement, there are mechanisms in place for parallel importation that basically allows countries to purchase uh, 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 prescription drugs from um, uh, one another. The issue of, of what at the time earlier on, I mean, everything was, was, was labeled cyber. Um, uh, in, this is an article in, in 2000 uh, on, on cyber medicine, the benefits and risks of purchasing drugs over the internet. Again, this is an issue that even within the legal and regulatory community is, is an established conversation. Uh, it's, it, it's been had. Uh, and over the last 20 years, you've had to this sort of emergence of different entities, both uh, online pharmacies, but also uh, 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 organizations that in a way mediate the trust between the patient and, and, and what they're getting. So um, uh, one, for example, is, is, is operated by the National Association of Board of Pharmacy, uh, as, as John mentioned, and they, they, they have this um, uh, VIPS uh, program uh, for verifying internet pharmacy uh, 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 standards. You have other uh, private uh, uh, approaches uh, or, or, or private sector approaches. So this is another one uh, by LegitScript uh, that uh, does um, something similar. And both NABP and LegitScript, in a way, have uh, relationships, as you see in the bottom of that, with intermediaries. Uh, LegitScript, for example, not just with, but um, uh, Google, Bing, Amazon, Facebook, other major intermediaries that people would use. Um, and then, of course, some others. And, and, and uh, I think they might be in the room, but the, uh, the, this uh, the Canadian uh, International Pharmaceutical Association, for example, has been operating uh, for, for almost 20 years uh, in, in this particular space, providing Canadian um, uh, approved uh, uh, medicines to, to consumers. Um, and of course, uh, another uh, 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 group, Pharmacy Checker. And, and, and the last two are not online pharmacies, but they basically serve that, that, that 
important function between the patient and uh, internet pharmacies, mediating that trust is how can you trust a particular website? Uh, and that's really what, uh, what the, the last two websites do. And they, they have this, the, the, uh, a series of checks and balances in place to, to appropriately credential and say, yes, this online pharmacy is appropriate or, 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 or stay away uh, from that. But they each take a, a, a very, they have a different group of, of internet pharmacies that uh, they have certified or credentialed. Um, for a number of different sort of um, uh, uh, reasons, which, which we'll get to in, in, in just a minute. Uh, now, because of the fact that you have these certification um, uh, uh, groups, um, uh, th that particular paper that I cited uh, argued that a blanket ban on all foreign websites uh, can deny consumers substantial savings uh, from certified uh, tier two websites. Uh, and so the last two that I mentioned, SIPA and Pharmacy Checker, are, are uh, what in this paper they tied uh, tier two. Tier one, the VIPs, the reason it's in a different category is uh, they, as I mentioned, have a very particular interpretation and understanding of what a legitimate online pharmacy is. Uh, so they, for example, uh, will only certify uh, an, online an online pharmacy to join or to get VIPs uh, uh, accreditation. Uh, if so only products that uh, uh, will, if, if, they, if it's a foreign website that claims to import into the US, uh, it's considered uh, uh, a, a, an illicit or a rogue website. Uh, so it doesn't pass its compliance if you import. Um, and um, there, are, there are potential uh, issues with that, which, which we'll get to, but uh, that's a particular uh, interpretation. Um, um, and so uh, the argument with, with this uh, particular paper is that if you, do not, in, in a way, uh, uh, allow for these channels for, for, for importing or, or credential online pharmacies. Uh, you're increasingly pushing uh, patients to other markets that the problem, in a way, doesn't just go away. Uh, and this is sort of really the third reason why it doesn't serve consumer safety and consumer health, uh, because uh, you, in making a restrictive uh, 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 market, or if you, if you restrict the, the particular people that are able to access uh, uh, the, the market and, and the, the number of different uh, online pharmacies that are able to operate, uh, patients move to different uh, platforms. So this, these, there's a series of papers, for example, uh, that look at how it's uh, going to social media, uh, Instagram, for example, uh, Twitter, um, and, and that's becoming a, a major problem. And particularly uh, in the US, this has been quite, quite uh, prominent with, with the opioid uh, problem. Uh, and um, in, in a way, to, to then think about these 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 uh, issues uh, from a from a, a perspective, then if if this is uh, both a legitimate issue uh, and it requires uh, then addressing, uh, who ought to do uh, that regulating, uh, and what does that look like? So so thinking about that 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 regulation both from a from a why perspective and and, and, and a who perspective, uh, and so if these uh, 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 digital marketplaces for medicines are inevitable in a way, then you need uh, regulation. And, and really, from a WHO perspective, regulation is, is we're talking about totality of measures, legal uh, measures, administrative measures, technical measures uh, that state and non-state actors uh, undertake to ensure the safety, quality, and efficacy uh, of medicines. And from a slide from a, from a colleague at the WHO uh, who is in charge of uh, uh, the WHO's uh, uh, regulatory support program. Um, the argument, in, in a sense, is um, that there is, is a risk in, in both over-regulating access to medicines and under-regulating access to medicines. So in under-regulation, or when you have vulnerabilities in, in, in these markets, uh, you can lead to irrational consumption, so you can expose patients to, to, to markets that are unsafe, uh, and it can affect the quality of drugs that, that then the patient uh, receives. Uh, and that, of course, has, is, an, is a, an important public health uh, risk. But at the same time, uh, overregulation um, uh, or improper regulation or inappropriate regulation uh, has a set of challenges as well. Um, uh, is is uh, you have access issues with, with with patients being able to access it? As we said, uh, there's cost issues that costs in a way you can't have uh, access to those cost savings. Uh, and uh, as as we showed with with the previous example, you uh, have a challenge with with access that is then diverted to channels that are that are less regulated. <clears throat> 
Um, and this, again, was, was, was echoed uh, in, in, in thinking about some of these ethical issues and why we should do this uh, is, is, is uh, in, in this particular, uh, and, and I won't read it, but it's, it's basically a warning uh, both of neither adopting technophobia or technophilia. Uh, so neither being afraid of, of the market and saying we, we, we shouldn't because it has these uh, uh, challenges to, to patient harm, um, but also not over-regulating or inappropriately regulating the issue uh, based on ignorance or misplaced fear. Uh, for example, uh, because you, you lose the benefits potentially uh, for patients. Uh, and so really what, what it, it, it's about is, is finding that regulatory sweet spot. Uh, what is that sweet spot for, for both promoting public health and, and consumer uh, uh, safety, uh, but also uh, ensuring, ensuring uh, choice and uh, protecting them against um, uh, markets as well. Um, and this is where, uh, again, the, the, the concept of, of sort of regulation uh, comes in. And it's not a very uh, popular uh, uh, phrase. It's oftentimes uh, uh, blamed for a lot of what goes wrong, but uh, it's, it's, it's quite, it, it's used again, in, in, in regulatory regimes are, 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 are utilized both in the public, private, and, and non-state uh, sector. So uh, I just want to briefly go through some of the different ways that different stakeholders uh, sort of approached uh, the, 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 the regulation of this particular uh, problem. Uh, so from a state perspective, if you look at it from an individual nation state perspective, uh, and because again, uh, we have jurisdictional issues both with the internet, but regulations are oftentimes uh, drafted at the national level and they have, uh, 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 they, they apply uh, within countries uh, or within jurisdictions. Um, LegitScript puts out these really uh, uh, helpful sort of internet uh, pharmacy policy guides uh, where for every single different country there is there's a different uh, regulations around whether you are able to uh, import uh, uh, medicines and what channels you're able to do it. Uh, and so here is just a number of them for, for the US, for Canada, for Germany, um, Brazil, uh, Thailand, etc. Uh, but if you'll indulge me just to take a slight uh, US-centric uh, focus, and not because I think uh, it's an issue, I'm, I'm not American, not because it's an issue there, but uh, as, as, uh, as will become evident, sometimes uh, where rules are made on uh, uh, internet governance issues have broad implications uh, around uh, the world. Uh, and uh, as you would imagine, the, 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 the countries and, and the entities that have the largest rule-making capacity oftentimes set uh, the rules. Uh, and so it's important oftentimes to, to, to to observe uh, not just what the rules are, are, are uh, that, that are uh, developed in places like uh, the United States, but also because it has, as I said, implications for uh, uh, countries, and, and particularly around an issue like this, which is an emerging marketplace uh, and will likely lead to a lot of adaptation of, of, of policies at the uh, national level as well. So if we are to look at uh, the U.S., um, uh, for example, um, you can then think about who ought to regulate this, right? So, so an obvious um, uh, answer would be the, the Ministry of Health, for example, or the Department of Health and Human Services, or within uh, the HHS, the, the F uh, Food and Drug Administration, which deals with um, uh, regulating the pharmaceutical su uh, uh, supply within the United States and what's imported. Um, but because this, there is an importation or there is, a, uh, there is also criminal potential in, in, in the rogue pharmacy uh, dimension to it, you could also invoke, of course, um, uh, the Drug Enforcement Agency, which it has been, uh, the, the Customs and Border Protection uh, Group within the, the Homeland Security, and of course, uh, Department of Justice, because there are, as I said, okay, at times, uh, uh, criminal uh, components. But at the same time, because we're talking about the internet, uh, you could also invoke uh, the, the FCC uh, that deals with telecommunications, uh, the NTIA, um, uh, or uh, the trade representative. So there's a variety of different uh, actors that can, that can participate. At the same time, within a particular country, you, you can also have a set of policies that, that are interpreted differently, but within the country. Um, and so um, sometimes, for example, when you have acute uh, issues, um, uh, like opioids, for example, for, was, 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 a, was a, is, is a public health issue that the US for the last decade has, has really uh, had uh, uh, a lot of trouble dealing with. Uh, and so on, on opioids specifically, for example, there was a, there was a Senate Act uh, to deal with the um, importation of, of, of opioids from rogue markets. Now, uh, we don't really know how big of a problem 
online pharmacies were for opioids. Uh, it certainly was a problem in the physical healthcare system as well. The, the way, the ease with which patients were able to receive opioids was, was not a problem. That was an online problem. It was a problem at the pharmacy, and it was a problem the way opioids were marketed to health professionals. Um, nonetheless, you have uh, a, a set of policies when you have acute health uh, challenges. Um, but then the FDA also has uh, what they call the personal importation policy, for example, uh, that specifically deals with this particular issue of, of when you have transnational online pharmacies, pharmacies that, that ship products from abroad, uh, are you able to uh, use them and, and when are you able to use them? And so they have in this PIP, they, the, it was developed by the FDA uh, and it's supposed to be enforced by Customs and Border Protection. Uh, under uh, the, the, the PIP, you're, a US consumer is allowed to import up to a 90-day supply of non-controlled, so for example, opioids are controlled. Uh, online pharmacies are not allowed to import opioids, for example, or cancer drugs, or anything that requires really complex cold chain refrigeration, et cetera. Uh, so for those non-controlled, or what online pharmacies often call maintenance medication, so if you need a statin for um, heart disease, if you need, um, uh, uh, for, again, for chronic diseases, these maintenance medications that you need regularly uh, for those particular prescription drugs, you, and if it's for personal use and for 90-day supply, you're supposed to be able to uh, import uh, those particular drugs. Now, this is a particular policy. This is not, um, uh, uh, it, it, is, is subject to interpretation, uh, both um, uh, across the different federal agencies, but also uh, within uh, the country. States have interpreted differently. Um, and so um, it, in a way, within um, uh, some of the sort of shadow regulation literature, it's, it, it's referred to as sort of discretionary guidelines. These are guidelines that, in, in a very large sense, are discretionary up to the discretion of the particular uh, body. And so when I mentioned, for example, the, the NABP's uh, VIPs, the Verified Internet Pharmacy uh, Program, uh, its particular interpretation uh, is that it's technically illegal to import drugs into the US, so we will not certify any website that imports into the US, period, full stop. It, no nuanced interpretation, no uh, in, incorporating the personal importation policy into its guidelines. Any website that imports into the US is deemed rogue, uh, and it actually puts out these figures. Um, uh, it, it claims to, for example, monitor 11,000 or so websites, 96% uh, of which it classifies as rogue or out of compliance. And when you look at their, that data, which, which is, is, is fun to do, 85% um, of those 96, so, so most of the ones that are deemed uh, non-compliant are deemed so because they import into the US or because uh, they require uh, a, a, a state uh, uh, prescription uh, to, to, to do so. Uh, and so that's a, a very particular interpretation of the, the, uh, the, the personal importation policy, uh, in effect a very stringent uh, application. Uh, and because of that, uh, and because it's a policy, that's one interpretation. Some other uh, actors within uh, the, the US have interpreted fundamentally differently, for example. Uh, and so you've had this issue again in the last year, the uh, last two years, really become more prominent of, of sub-national. Uh, so at the state level, at the county level, at the city level, uh, at the at a school system-wide level, uh, sidestepping uh, some of the uh, crackdowns around particularly Canadian pharmacies um, uh, by the, the, the NABP. Uh, and certain states have even uh, adapted, uh, adopted sorry, uh, importation laws uh, that allow, uh, basically, uh, various wholesalers and, 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 and uh, increasingly um, uh, personal importation as well to, 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 uh, to, per to import them in from the US. And so this, in a way, at the state level, is led by this group um, called the National, um, uh, Acad uh, so the National Academy of uh, State Health uh, Policy. Um, uh, and so they basically draft health uh, policies. Uh, but it's also the, the, the big hallmark position by the current Trump administration to deal with the issue of drug pricing. So he's made a series of, of, of statements uh, throughout uh, the last six months, uh, basically uh, stating that um, one way to perhaps address the cost issue is to allow importing from, from Canada. Uh, and, and he's sort of uh, been itching with, with an executive order uh, to do so, and he's, he's tasked both the HHS and uh, uh, the FDA to develop uh, clear guidelines and clear instructions uh, for doing uh, so.
the other uh, way to sort of deal with the issue is, is to, to not uh, uh, approach it from a state perspective and to, to really look at the different uh, non-state uh, approaches to, to, to this particular space. Uh, and among them, I, the, the, the most established really are, uh, as, as I mentioned, these, these credentialing uh, agencies um, that um, uh, uh, in a way have been able to validate the, the, the safety and the, the, the legality of, 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 of the products uh, that, that are uh, imported. Uh, and so uh, you've, you've got the ones that I've sort of showed you, NABP, LegitScript, uh, CIPA, uh, Pharmacy Checker, uh, and as I said, the last two, um, like CIPA, for example, they, 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 the, the, the category of products that they allow uh, uh, or, or that they, uh, the, 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 the companies that they certify, internet pharmacy companies that they certify, uh, they sell Health Canada approved product. And that is premised on a very particular idea that uh, you have what's called regulatory equivalence. And the idea is that um, the uh, products that the FDA certifies and the products that, that um, uh, are, are certified uh, by Health Canada, for example, um, A, you oftentimes have similar products, similar formulations that have to receive regulatory approval, um, but also that the FDA and Health Canada, for example, example, have um, uh, mutual recognition of one another's uh, uh, functions. And so uh, the, the, the products that are then uh, uh, imported uh, into or, or that the patients are able to procure uh, is, is, is Health Canada approved. But the other thing that they, they all of these require is, is, is uh, uh, something that I sort of mentioned in passing, but a valid uh, uh, prescription, right? Is you need to have a valid prescription from uh, a, a, um, a, a state um, uh, a board certified physician uh, for uh, this uh, to be uh, able to be possible. And what, for example, uh, a, a pharmacy checker or SIPA, uh, as uh, these credentialing agencies do, is they ensure that uh, the website that advertises uh, medicines, these internet pharmacies online, uh, do they have mechanisms in place to make sure that someone is definitely looking at those prescriptions, and someone is, is, is ensuring that this is appropriate for the patient, uh, and the person who has to do that in the jurisdiction where the medicine is dispensed has to also be board certified. So it has to be a board certified physician, for example, in a Canadian province, that then basically allows that particular physician to write a co script so they are able to co-sign the prescription from the American um, um, uh, physician that a Canadian pharmacist is then able to uh, uh, fill that prescription and then ship it to the US. And so it's this, this, this uh, mechanism that basically uh, recognizes uh, equivalence among the, the, the capacity of a, phys of a physician in the US and a physician, for example, in Manitoba to, to read a script, to understand, to read the patient file, uh, and to be able to uh, co-sign uh, co uh, a script. Now this is, again, not a practice that is uh, unique to online pharmacies. The caravans to Canada, for example, uh, is uh, those uh, 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 states that are along the Canadian border. Uh, this is uh, a practice that is 20, 30 years old, at least from, from what I've seen, and probably older, of, of people traveling across uh, the US-Canada border, uh, either going to a Canadian clinic uh, and uh, getting a prescription from a Canadian physician. So they pay for the clinic and they pay to get that prescription and they're able to import it, and they're allowed to under the PIP, or you increasingly have these uh, physicians that, are, uh, that have dual licenses. I have a license in a state in the US and have a license in, in a province in Canada, and they're able to co-sign, in a sense, uh, a script. Uh, and so what, where these credentialing uh, agencies come in is, is they fill this important role to make sure that the trust, the, 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 the function that, for example, when I go to a, 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 an apothecary here or, or a pharmacy here, uh, is I trust that that pharmacist is, is, is competent and when I get a script from my, from my physician, I, I trust that that is appropriate, that that's what I need. Um, and so that trust that we oftentimes mediate uh, has to be mediated somehow online to make sure that the products are uh, uh, appropriate. Uh, and an analogy, for, of course, for example, is, is, is with um, uh, Amazon as a digital marketplace, right? Is, is you read either the reviews or who the seller is and you want to make sure that the product is, is a legitimate and appropriate uh, and that the seller is, is, is accredited as well. And even that system, although I, I would argue the credentialing agencies in the internet pharmacy space do a far better job than, than Amazon does, uh, because increasingly you've got this problem of, 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 of shops being able to change the products and the SKU numbers uh, and, and benefit from all the trust that 
a particular number of reviews or, or, uh, or, or a particular sort of a product code has, has been able to garner and then able to substitute it. And, and this is a rampant, rampant problem both uh, with, with counterfeits on, on Amazon and also with, with some of these third party uh, sellers. And so this self-regulation is, 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 is quite important uh, in this space as in, in, in other spaces in, uh, across the internet. Uh, and of course, in, in, in the EU, EU, just to sort of take a different, uh, they, they have a, a, a different approach of, of uh, regulating these online shops um, through this particular, what they call the common EU logo. And the idea is that uh, this is sort of an agreement ac um, among uh, different regulatory authorities and it's part of the uh, a, 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 an EU um, uh, uh, directive uh, that basically um, uh, promotes these internet pharmacies to, 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 to register with the regulatory authority and in putting that particular logo that you see in the bottom corner on the website, a customer is able to click on that and it's supposed to lead them to the regulatory uh, authority. And so these methods of, of, of mediating trust are, are, are quite important. Uh, besides that, you also have a professional, um, a pro just going. the professional associations that play an incredibly important role. So this is a paper uh, that I looked at uh, before, uh, and, and there they look at the role of a, a, of a professional agency, and we're talking about particularly health professionals, so pharmacists and physicians, uh, that there is this potential um, distributed justice argument that as health professionals, uh, you ought to um, uh, provide uh, opportunities. You have, in a sense, a moral commitment um, to, 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 pr to address the health needs. Uh, and uh, pharmacists uh, and, and, and physicians, uh, in, in a sense, have this uh, particular uh, commitment uh, as well to ensure access to legitimate uh, prescriptions. And so the, that co-signing practice that, that I uh, described is because in at least a couple provinces in, in Canada, uh, a physician is able to do that. A physician is able to receive a prescription from a US um, uh, 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 patient uh, and is able to evaluate, make sure that it's, it's um, safe, make sure through reviewing the patient file that that medicine is appropriate. Uh, some internet pharmacies even offer consulting uh, services, um, uh, including for example, being able to speak to uh, a, a, the phys a physician or a pharmacist uh, to, to, if you have any questions about your script. So that's a particular function uh, that, uh, is, is that, that we're sort of used to in, in, in physical pharmacies that they're able to provide. Um, and it's that particular face-to-face -face aspect that oftentimes uh, is, is another aspect that, uh, that, that a lot of um, jurisdictions cha challenge whether this would work is, is, is you're supposed to be able to face-to-face -face see your pharmacist or your physician. How do you deal with that? Um, and again, that is not a problem that is unique to internet pharmacies. Um, this is becoming increasingly common. Uh, I know at least in, in Canada, in Toronto where I'm from, uh, we have now these programs. This is the Ontario Telemedicine Network uh, where you're able to actually connect to a physician who is able to diagnose you and is able to prescribe. Uh, my, uh, uh, my healthcare program provides this opportunity, so instead of me, for example, going into a, a clinic and potentially getting others sick or getting myself sick, I can just hop online within 50 minutes, talk to a physician, get a script for something. Not for everything, of course, but for some things. Uh, and likewise, speak to a pharmacist uh, if I need to. Uh, so we, in some areas, we've, we've mediated that, that relationship, that that face-to-face -face, uh, can be, be, be addressed. So it's not a particularly unique problem, uh, but it's certainly a problem that, that uh, needs to be filled in. And, and some uh, internet pharmacies, that particularly the ones that are certified, uh, provide this particular service as well. Um, besides professional associations, you also have um, uh, a lot of uh, civil society organizations that are in this field. So there is uh, a number of, for example, at, at the UN level, we call them bingos and pingos, public interest and private interest uh, uh, civil society organizations. So among the public interest, among the pingos, are organizations like, uh, like the CPPH, the Campaign for Personal Prescription uh, Importation, sorry, CPPI, um, that uh, is, is uh, again, looking at this particular issue uh, from, from a concerned citizen's perspective of, of cost is an issue, access is an issue, uh, can we, um, uh, uh, in a sense, take uh, advantage of legal pathways to import uh, medicines? Um, and uh, organizations, and, and I, I believe we've got someone from EFF here as well, that look at this particular issue from a digital governance perspective, uh, and particularly from that interpretation of the FDA's uh, basically allowing this to happen, and why is this not uh, more, uh, why is it not regulated or mediated uh, in, a, in, a, in a wider way? And this is an issue they've been sort of monitoring for at least five, six years.
And then you have a number of uh, business interest bingos, business interest uh, uh, civil society organizations. So this is one, for example, uh, the Center for Safe Internet Pharmacies, um, uh, and uh, another is, is ASOP, uh, the Association of Safe Online Pharmacies. Uh, and the reason uh, their, their business interest uh, is because they're either financially supported or uh, they uh, are in other ways associated or, or, or supported uh, with largely industry. Uh, and so this from ASOP's YouTube webpage, uh, an overview of, of who their partners are. Uh, as you can see, it's, it's, it's just uh, uh, those are all not either uh, larger uh, wholesale distributors or pharmaceutical companies that, in, in a sense, are members of uh, uh, that particular community. And the reason I want to separate them is, of course, their interests, their whys are fundamentally different in, in their approach. While they may have a common uh, goal of, of ensuring uh, the safety, neither of them want bad products or want to compromise safety, um, they take a different interpretation of, of whether it's possible and how it's possible. Um, and so um, the, 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 the business interest, the, 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 um, uh, the, the public interest uh, is, is taking a, a, an interpretation of what is legally possible and how can you improve access uh, and how can you address the cost issue, uh, whereas uh, some of the, the methods, and, and we'll get to uh, just briefly with, with uh, um, uh, private interest, is, is you are, in a way, the, the efforts are to protect the existing market and the existing channels, uh, and, and in a way using uh, part of the, the, the sort of argument that uh, EFF, for example, in that article makes, is using the argument of, of consumer safety um, uh, as a way to create restrictive regimes that basically don't allow people to, to take advantage uh, of this. Uh, and um, lastly, because of this, uh, uh, not just the, 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 the fact that the supply chains are global, um, but because it, it transcends borders, and when we're talking about internet pharmacies, likewise it transcends borders, uh, you have to think about some of the internet governance uh, uh, parties that are involved in this. Um, and so one particular way or one particular uh, uh, group that uh, was involved because of the transnational nature uh, of the internet uh, is uh, the ICANN, of course, which, which most of you uh, are familiar with. But uh, what's uh, Im important, what they did a few years ago, is, is they had the, uh, a new uh, a release of new generic top-level domains. Uh, and uh, in that period between 2013 and 2014, uh, they released um, uh, hundreds, I think it's, it's, it's thousands, 1,500, up 1,500 top-level domains, and I think now we're, we're up to 1,600. Um, and obviously some of those are country-specific uh, or language-specific. Um, some of them are in highly regulated industries, like banking, for example, or, um, but others uh, were, there was this process for filing um, a, um, a, an application for becoming uh, a, an, uh, an operator for a top-level domain. Uh, and among those uh, that was released was the dot .pharmacy domain. Uh, so in uh, 2013, the dot .pharmacy domain was uh, then, um, uh, uh, the operator of the dot .pharmacy domain uh, was, was uh, given to uh, the National Association of Boards of Pharmacies. NABP, uh, and, and that's the, uh, the, the group uh, that I mentioned uh, that took a very, very, they, they manage the VIPS uh, program, uh, the Verified Internet Pharmacy uh, program, uh, and they take a very particular interpretation of what is and isn't legal. Um, uh, and so you had this, the, 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 this uh, published, and within the American Journal of Health Systems uh, um, uh, pharmacies, you had um, even within that community sort of this, the, the articles that this is a new domain uh, that could expand the internet uh, community. Um, it hasn't really expanded uh, this, this particular space uh, in part because of how uh, NABP again interprets and, and, and credentials on what is and isn't safe. Uh, so as an operator, uh, uh, they have to vet who gets access to a dot .pharmacy uh, domain and who doesn't. Uh, and in a way, a dot .pharmacy domain is supposed to be international. It's supposed to, uh, uh, any uh, entity around the world is supposed to be able to um, uh, uh, obtain a dot .pharmacy domain. Um, but they, NABP uh, applies their domestic interpretation of uh, the FDA guidelines uh, or, or that very narrow uh, understanding on, on who is able to and who's not able to get a dot .pharmacy domain. So uh, if, again, any website or any entity that wants a dot .pharmacy domain, if they advertise that they import into the US, they are automatically sort of uh, excluded from being able to get uh, a, a dot .pharmacy uh, domain. 
Now, from a governance perspective, this this uh, is is it's interesting to sort of do some digging in terms of um, um, part of the potential conflicts uh, that that might have. Um, and one is even just the application process uh, that the, the, the people that have sort of uh, critiqued uh, the NABP on, in, in being able to obtain a dot pharmacy domain. Uh, and at the time, there was a, a, a big big cohort of of uh, uh, actors that sort of uh, critiqued uh, the NABP being able to have a dot pharmacy domain. Um, and that included a, 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 a petition that had, I think, 24,000 uh, signatures uh, at, at, at one point. Um, and in part, uh, if you even look at the, the groups that, that signed in support of the, of, of the NABP getting the pharmacy domain, uh, it was pharmaceutical companies like Sanofi and Eli Lilly, uh, the, uh, the far international pharmacy uh, group. Uh, this particular group uh, uh, enforced the act, which is no longer active and, and was only active for a short period of time, which is really odd, and of course, uh, the ASOPs. Um, and there have been concerns whether uh, the NABP uh, can remain impartial if it's able to, uh, uh, in a sense, serve a particular function. And, and there have been a number of um, uh, issues that have sort of, uh, uh, where, where, where it's been challenged, uh, both for this reason and many other reasons, the NABP's um, uh, role. Um, and the, NAB, uh, the NABP has also been, uh, uh, I think it was like two years ago, received a notice of breach of domain uh, agreement uh, for not having uh, sufficient transparency in its processes and inclusion uh, criteria and, and, and notification with sufficient time uh, in, a, in a sort of transparent way uh, on, 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 on applicants. And so um, um, uh, there, there have been a set of concerns. And lastly, uh, I just briefly want to talk about uh, uh, intermediaries. Uh, and, and here, I, maybe for this audience, I don't really have to explain it, uh, but it's, it's, it's all these particular actors in this particular space that, that mediate uh, where a user is seeking content or products or services on the internet and, the, and those that upload or, or, or have uh, that. And we're talking about ISPs, of course, certification authorities, DNS, content delivery networks, and then all the network platforms, search engines, e-commerce, payment processors, third-party platforms, uh, et cetera. And so within this space as well, they, they've become, uh, intermediaries have become, in a way, uh, as you can imagine, really important mediators on, 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 on uh, um, uh, the internet for, for a number of, in a number of different governance domains, uh, but also in this particular uh, issue. So when we're talking about, for example, um, um, the NABP's role, for example, uh, is uh, through uh, what's, what's called hybrid regulatory regimes in, in, in the literature, uh, you're able to e exert soft power uh, on uh, some of these intermediaries to, to, to either take down or take coercive action against some actors. Uh, and again, under their interpretation, uh, and this is in a sense called beyond regulation. So as we said, the FDA has a personal importation policy, but through a terms of service agreement for, for one of these intermediaries, you're able to um, uh, go above and beyond what the, what, what's in, in, in a sense stipulated in, in, in those regulations. Uh, and so in a sense, uh, some of these intermediaries are sort of caught between uh, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a difficult place um, uh, where they, uh, are sometimes subject to formal courts or, 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 or um, uh, formal sort of regulations, legal um, uh, uh, um, uh, agreements and legal um, uh, to the law, but sometimes that course of power is, is, is done in informal ways where they're, uh, in a sense, informed of a particular breach of a, of a DNS abuse, for example, content abuse, and they're asked to take action uh, and, and not in a, in a formal court order way, as, as, as I mentioned, but through, for example, a particular um, uh, um, uh, entity's interpretation of what that breach is. Um, and this has happened a number of times uh, with search engines, for example, with DNS uh, domain service providers, uh, and, uh, and 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 obviously payment providers, for example, like Visa and Mastercard and Amex, who are members, who are uh, su who are supporters of the uh, uh, Center for Safe Internet Pharmacies, for example. 
Uh, and it's been extensively written about is, is this idea of these intermediaries in a way uh, becoming sort of um, this new sort of class of global private regulators of the internet. Um, and even the UNESCO uh, document on intermediaries a couple of years ago um, uh, wrote that the operation of intermediaries are heavily, uh, and this was sort of a UNESCO uh, document, by the legal and policy environments of particular states. Um, and extent that the state policies, laws, and regulations uh, are inadequately, in a sense, aligned with their duty to facilitate and support intermediaries aspects uh, for freedom of expression uh, and and in a sense uh, that uh, uh, the, the bottom talks about this concept of beyond regulation of, of extra legal content restrictions uh, that sometimes uh, not because sometimes because intermediaries play that role often sometimes because they are coerced by by um, for example the, the uh, some civil society organizations that deem this problematic like ASOP or uh, the NABP and others interpretation uh, one problem, one solution that's emerged, or, or one potential sort of intermediary response to this, uh, and, and it started with, with because of the opioid problem, is this concept of the trusted notifier uh, system. Uh, and this uh, was a, a um, uh, in a sense, is, is sort of mediated by the National Telecommunications Information Administration in the U.S. Um, together with the FDA. Uh, and the idea is, is can you set up uh, to, to address this problem a, a trusted notifier? Uh, solution where you basically, instead of sort of depending on these uh, sometimes court ordered, sometimes um, sort of suggestion that there has been a potential breach, a trusted notifier network, so a network of individual experts who are able to um, uh, provide, uh, to notify uh, the, for example, a, a, an intermediary like a domain, uh, 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 like a DNS, for example, who then requests additional information from the content provider before they are forced to take uh, action. And so this, there, there's, a, there's a current pilot uh, between the NTIA and FDA in collaboration with um, VeriSign that manages the .com uh, domain and PIR that manages the ORG uh, domain, um, uh, uh, top level domain, uh, to, 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 to evaluate whether this is, is, is possible. Uh, there are a number of concerns with the trusted notifier system, of course, uh, on who is determined to be a trusted notifier. Do you just need one notification to take something down? Uh, and, and how do you ensure that uh, it's compliant with, 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 with law? Um, and what happens when that person, for example, goes to another organization? Is, is it, is it uh, a person or an institution uh, that uh, plays uh, that particular role? Uh, but it's at least a, a, um, a, a, a solution or, or, or one particular regulatory approach uh, that these intermediaries are exploring. Uh, so I will conclude uh, with just a couple of final reflections, um, uh, and I'll make them very brief, uh, that sort of are, are captured in that final uh, section uh, of, of the, the, the paper. Uh, and in the first instance, is is this concept that uh, in many ways uh, what we're talking about is, is this mediation of trust, is, is how do you mediate trust? When I go to a pharmacy, there's a, there's a certain delegation of trust I have to professionalism. When I go to certain online digital market places, there is a delegation of trust to particular uh, platforms. Uh, and the argument is, is when you in this shift from the, uh, the, 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 the physical to the online world, uh, there, this jurisdictional concern of, of mediating trust uh, becomes uh, a problem, uh, and particularly as you uh, return again to, to, to the who's, the why's, the where's, and the how's these rules uh, are set. And to some extent, part of the argument is, uh, is, is that um, it's, it's sequence matters. It's not a sort of a flat um, uh, uh, state uh, that uh, the who and the why, particularly whether it's states, whether it's certain non-state actors, whether it's particular intermediaries, and the interests that inform that regulation uh, will impact what platforms and, and what forms that regulation takes, uh, and, and ultimately uh, what, what, what happens. Uh, and, and that's important in a sense because the, the goal of this process is to uh, balance, as the Global Status Report argues, uh, competing legitimate interests. And that's what, these, that's what in a sense, uh, part of the, the, the challenge of, of regulation is. And that's really what a regulatory challenge is, is sort of composed of, is when you have to balance competing uh, legitimate uh, interests. But at the same time, you, you don't, in a way, uh, it is not a value-free or, 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 or on an equal footing. It's certain 
particular interests uh, have to, in a sense, take precedence. I, for example, take a, a, a public health approach to this particular problem, and from a public health approach, which uh, entities ought to uh, undertake what action uh, in, in, in what uh, jurisdictions. Uh, and there, there is a, a final uh, call uh, for potentially um, uh, approaching this rulemaking uh, process uh, from a uh, norm perspective, norm-based perspective, is how do you start with particular norms? What, how, how do you start with the why? in order to, 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 to get to the who's and the what's. Uh, and the idea, uh, in a sense, is to return to, to sort of the Tunis agenda is, is what are these forums? What are these uh, forums that, that are inclusive, that are multi-stakeholder, that are transparent uh, in order uh, to, to arrive at a set of, 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 of commonly agreed uh, rules, norms, procedures uh, in order to inform uh, this particular work? And, and I just finally want to touch on one particular one uh, of those uh, that, that we participated in, uh, and that's um, over the last couple uh, RightsCon conferences uh, in uh, 2017 in Brussels in 2018, uh, where we refined, uh, where I participated in, in, in that process with a panel of multi-stakeholders in refining uh, what ultimately became uh, the Brussels principles. And so this has now uh, been online, uh, and this, uh, 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 in a way, um, articulates a set of norms around uh, uh, the sale of medicines over the internet. Uh, and and in, in, in because of some of the stakeholders that are involved, it's supposed to be in sort of a very uh, intergovernmental, multi-stakeholder forum language, uh, where you make a certain number of rec recognitions, uh, and then you establish a set of um, uh, principles uh, that you argue. And I, I won't go through all of them. You're able to see them, both in the paper, I think we've included the Brussels principles, but also at brusselsprinciples.org. Uh, but these principles uh, that basically argue for, uh, for from, from a public health perspective, but also in balancing uh, consumer safety and consumer health on, on these issues, and particularly the role that, that these intermediaries uh, play in, in, in shaping uh, some of these guidelines. Uh, so I will uh, end there. Uh, I would urge you to... to I'm, I'm really happy to, to receive all kinds of comments, uh, even if I'm totally off base, if I'm missing certain things, uh, it's available, and if, if, if you uh, don't have a physical copy, please feel free uh, to email me as well. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Arya. That was really, really rich. Lots of information, lots to digest. We have um, about uh, 10 minutes, and I would like people who have a question maybe to step to the queue. Uh, I want to just turn, there were two, two organizations invoked in your conversation particularly, and I know that we have uh, the Senior Vice President of VeriSign, Patrick Kane, with us, and I know we've been talking about trusted notifiers. Uh, Pat, may I just get your thoughts on uh, what was brought up for trusted notifiers? Sorry, buddy. Sure, thanks, Ron. Um, first of all, ICANN does not have a trusted notifier program per se. There is a conversation that's going on within the community right now about how to address uh, DNS abuse. And one of, the, one, of the key, one of the key pieces of that is identifying what the definition of DNS abuse is. I think registries and registrars are um, recognize that there's more that needs to be done. Uh, in an earlier session, McKaylee Nalon on the ICANN, in the ICANN session earlier today, indicated there's a framework put together by several registries and registrars in talking about what to do and what, and, and what more can be done. Um, different registries and registrars will take a look at this problem in different manners. Uh, some talk about what they do, some don't talk about what they do in terms of addressing takedowns and addressing what goes on from a content perspective. So it's a, it's a conversation that's held within the ICANN community. Now it's interesting, one of the, one of the um, uh, things you put up there just, just recently, Aria, was the, DN, the, the domain name wire uh, about .com and having more, more uh, trusted notifier programs. But um, what we've committed to in Amendment 35 with NTIA is to work through community-driven uh, processes to address issues. It's not necessarily specifically that we've committed to a trusted notifier program, but we've told NTIA that when these things come in, we will be a participant and, and help drive towards that. So, so I th I'm sure McKaylee has more to say on that particular issue maybe, but uh, the community does recognize that more needs to be done and more can be done. But I think in, in going through your, your presentation, uh, it really is about how to create a white list, if you will, of, of those that do well, as opposed to what the Trust and Notifier program really is, or the concept really is, which is to identify bad behavior and address the bad behavior. So it's the other side of that coin, and that's not the exact conversation we're having within the community right now. All right. 
Thanks, Pat. That was very helpful. And uh, the other person I saw in the audience is EFF, uh, Jillian York. And uh, as you were invoked, and it's talking about the various issues that EFF have taking a stand on, perhaps you could share a few thoughts. Sure. I'll just turn around so I can actually see you. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I really appreciate this. This is, I have to say, um, pharmacies are not my expertise at all. So this is a really interesting conversation uh, to be a part of. But we do a lot of work around shadow regulation and particularly the ways that intermediaries, um, I'm not going to say coerced because I think that intermediaries have a full responsibility to be good actors and in a lot of t cases they're not. Um, to give an example, I would say that if we're looking at, for example, right now, um, some of the regulations around the ways that um, terrorism and terrorist uh, extremist speech is being regulated by companies. Um, a lot of times they're not actually following the law, they're going far beyond it, um, and sometimes under pressure from governments, but also sometimes just because their lawyers are overly restrictive in their interpretations of the law. Um, and similarly, we're seeing this uh, with the advent of SESTA-FOSTA in the United States and the ways that um, intermediaries are, instead of you know looking carefully at the law and interpreting it, just kind of throwing throwing everything into the wind and going far too far in the ways that they restrict sexual speech. Um, so in this sense, um, like I said, not an expert on pharmacies, but I think you know a couple of the things that we're concerned about are the ways in which harm reduction um, discussions are being regulated and shut down on some of the major social media platforms, um, as well as, of course, everything that you've spoken about, but I, I can't say it better than you. So. <laughs> thank, well, thank you very much. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, I'll take that. Um, I'm going to uh, turn to Klaus, I see at the microphone, and then I'm going to look, are there any questions online coming in? If there are, that would follow. Okay, nothing. Please, Klaus, go ahead, you have the mic. Thank you very much. Klaus Stoll. Um, there's a lot of comments I would like to make, and it would take about half an hour. Just let me restrict to one or two. You treated the subject as pharmacies are a little bit self-standing entities, and they are not. They are part of a big ecosystem. First of the whole telemedicine, and then secondly into other area. And all these certification things you mentioned are just treating one aspect of pharmacies. They're forgetting completely two much more important aspects. It's not only important that the that the uh, truck is safe, but that the patient or whoever is accessing an online pharmacy, that his dignity and integrity as an internet user is respected. We know about these things that you basically can make money more on the data about that patient than I'm selling him uh, than what you're making on the trucks. That is one of the things. The second point is that we have to look Nothing in this world doesn't work without money. And we need to find, we have to find new business models for online pharmacies and things like that, how to do that. Now let me come to these self-regulations, Mark. So what we have to do, we shouldn't, shouldn't waste our time with trusted certifiers. We shouldn't trust, uh, waste our time with trust marks, which just... Uh, use a minute aspect of a product and don't see the whole thing. And there, I just want to let you know there are, uh, there are um, uni uh, initiatives on the way to do that, and one of them is, for example, I'm connected with, which basically looks at not only the product, but also on the digital integrity and also on the uh, financial stuff. So there are ways. This, what you just discussed, shouldn't be discussed in a in a, uh, in a isolated way with pharmacies. This is part of our whole product. And that brings me to one of the last points. You said, okay, we need to find institution, we need to find things uh, uh, to, uh, to, get, to get these pro uh, things going. No, we don't. Why? Because we are not there yet. We haven't established the principle, the ethical principles, and the things we are do, do, we will have this discussion on. So if we d start discussing now without agreeing the principles, we are basically starting in the first floor to building the house and haven't done the foundation. So I really, really warn about these things. We need more. We need this discussion and discussion. What we need to do now is to talk about how to translate the Universal Declaration of Human Rights into digital values and then talk on that basis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and I would suggest that uh, during the course of the week, 
get with Aria, because I think you've got some good points. Yes, please, people. thank you. I, I, I just quickly, I, I appreciate it. I think all your comments. This is not definitive work. This is a scoping review uh, that sets out, I think, a, a number of particular questions that uh, we're finding are, are emerging and re-emerging in a number of different uh, domains, and particularly at that intersection of, of, of digital governance and, and public health. And so uh, to, to all your points of, of, of being careful of thinking of these other uh, interests, uh, but the, 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 the point at the end in terms of arriving uh, at, at a set of norms that are collectively decided, uh, you have to include digital rights, have to include uh, the, the, the aspect that not all interests are equal, not all interests, like for example, there is there is this idea that, that um, a market uh, protection, for example, is, is, a, is a legitimate uh, interest that is in competition sometimes with public health. Now when you form rules, laws, regulations, uh, do they have to be treated as equally or is, is it important to, to as you say, uh, have a norm-based approach uh, that includes, and, and something that I, I admit in the paper and, and I need to reiterate is, this is still in some ways a very global north uh, articulation of the particular problem. And on Thursday, for example, at least we'll have uh, someone, uh, a, 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 an extinguished distinguished colleague from, from Nigeria uh, providing a perspective, and I would urge you to come there on, on Thursday, on, on how the problem is being perceived there from both a, a digital governance and a digital rights perspective, but also from a, an access to medicines and, and the broader sort of systems perspective as well. So thank you, Klaus. Rhonda Silva, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Ron De Silva, ICANN Board, also uh, Executive Director of Internet to One Die Company. I am uh, an internet uh, and business executive, uh, and I rise kind of in that vein, um, not uh, professional in pharmaceuticals or in the medical profession, but I see where technology and medicine are, are really beginning to intersect, and, uh, and, and my reactions are sort of uh, with that lens. Uh, first, um, I can't help but respond. Uh, well, I read your paper and I, I enjoyed the read. And uh, in listening to your presentation, Aria, the slides um, first feel like they're colored more around uh, the US is this lucrative uh, pharmaceutical market and Canada wants to be able to sell discount drugs into, into the US. And I know um, that the issues you're raising are, are broader than that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk more about the broader issues, but I did kind of get that impression as I was sitting here. Um, and there are three, I think, uh, main reactions I get. Um, first is, uh, you know, today, uh, historically, when someone goes into a pharmacy, there's some level of trust walking into the facility that this pharmacy exists, it hasn't been shut down, it's not boarded up, somehow the government is, is uh, uh, regulating and respecting the supply chain and everything that goes into this so I can trust what I'm getting from the pharmacy. And, um, and that regula regulatory process is different from country to country. Some countries may have uh, a certain supply chain with a certain number of drugs, and another will have a different supply chain, different types of drugs. And uh, you talk about access, which really leads me to the second uh, reaction, which is um, you know thinking about access. Sometimes it's it's based on regulations in a particular government that uh, maybe certain drugs are trusted there, not in other locations. So somebody might want a particular drug that it's not accessible, not because. Um, it's not accessible in the, in the general market, it's just not accessible in their market because it's not uh, permissible uh, yet or perhaps ever uh, based on their local regulations. But then there's also um, access with respect to uh, supply chain. Maybe the suppliers don't have the, the right economics for them to, to build out into a particular country or a particular city or a particular region. And uh, thus the access is, is uh, just not availability because of those dynamics. And then the last is I think the financial uh, aspect, which I think you highlight a lot, and that is um, the drugs are perhaps there, but they're not affordable. And all those dynamics really drive, I think, or we're driving uh, consumers to breaking away from the trust and taking a bit of a gamble, which is, well, let me just try this online site. I know it's not the same as me walking into the pharmacy. I know I'm taking on some risk, and they're doing a calculation of, um, affordability or uh, accessibility versus uh, that uh, inherent uh, trust that they perhaps would otherwise have with their government regulating the pharmaceuticals in their, in, in their particular uh, situation. So um, I like, Ron, how you kind of mapped at the beginning of the area, near the end, you kind of brought it right back to it, is you know, how do we get um, some 
way of uh, capturing that certification process, that trust that you know exists today and physically walk into a pharmacy and put it into the digital domain. And, and you talked about perhaps um, in, in Europe, there's this you know nice little graphic that websites can put on, but what prevents any website from just sticking it on there? And is there a policing process where um, you know the governments in, in, in Europe have to go chase down these websites that are saying they have this thing, but they haven't actually certified for it? I don't know what that process is. I don't know what that looks like, but there's opportunity for uh, still fraud and masquerading that, yeah, I'm certified, but I, I'm not really. Um, but I, I think in general what you're raising is uh, you know, this issue of how do you map that trust into the digital space? I don't know the answers to that, and I, I think you're, you're wrestling with mechanisms for that, and mapping it into the namespace might be one way, and I think you asked you know, with the, uh, either the .com or the .org or, or even the .farmer, is there a way to do that? Um, and if so, then bigger problem is consumers today will walk into a pharmacy, they're used to that process. Knowing that uh, a particular name in the DNS is somehow mapped to that same level of trust, I don't know how you communicate that and how you get that across, and and then ensure through policies and otherwise that uh, you know there's 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 actually trust behind the, the 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 impression, the image that the consumer has to start with. So that's that's all like um, kind of this big blob of my my first reaction and my second reaction. And there's a third one that I'm walking away with, and that is, um, well, how is it that uh, you know go back to this. Um, very discounted uh, Canadian pharmaceuticals want to sell into this very lucrative U.S. market. Well, in general, how are uh, pharmaceuticals making um, products cheaper? You know, the impression I get from the pharmacy industry is R&D is very expensive. Um, the certification process is very expensive. If those um, are protected through into intellectual property and then are copied or mirrored or stolen or otherwise taken in some other market on the internet and then produced in very, very uh, inexpensive uh, methods and then sold back into some of these markets where the pharmaceuticals are selling at higher prices because they're trying to recoup their 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 R&D expenses. And, and in a lot of cases, those pharmaceutical companies are for-profit organizations who are also trying to you know, make sure their shareholders are, are rewarded for, for the investments they made. So you've got this other dynamic that's at play. And I think when you take all three of those, those issues and mash them together, you get this complexity that I think you're trying to expose in, uh, in, your, in your paper and, and also in your presentation here. So I don't know how we move that forward, and maybe that's why you're here. You're trying to get like reactions and responses and, and maybe some collective think around is there, is there a way to address the, the labeling and the, and the trust and, and the technology in some way to be able to open up the marketplace and yet protect all those different interests in a way that is, that is fair and, and reasonable? Thank you very much, Ron. I'm going to, uh, I'm, I see we've got Laurie at the, t at the microphone, and I see we're also w well past our time. Uh, so I'm going to ask you if you wouldn't mind just to respond to the trust mark, uh, so make that clear, and also about the pricing uh, element. If yeah. you could make those short comments. Just, yeah, for, first of all, I think that the, the, the big conversation in Canada is actually a lot of alarm, that this could overwhelm the Canadian supply. So actually, the conversation in Canada is actually the exact opposite of this is a potential national security concern for Canadian supply. There's one study that, that estimates if even just 10% of American uh, uh, users were, were to use the Canadian system, it would exhaust the Canadian supply in 224 days. Uh, so the conversation is actually, it's, it's, you're, you're right, it, it's far more nuanced. Uh, on, on the issue of trust, is is your 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 right? It's 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 people make a certain gamble online in 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 meeting that particular trust. There's a way of of doing things, and then a way for various reasons, whether it's convenience, whether it's privacy, whether it's cost, which is which is the major one. Uh, the EU, just as a sort of uh, a footnote, uh, it's not just the logo that they put on. The idea is through the risk communication, people are supposed to click on that logo, and that logo is supposed to go back to the national regulatory authority. The, at least from what they say, and I, 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 I don't have sort of internet coding background, that only particular websites are allowed to then link back to, to that, and that's the way they sort of uh, mediate it, but you're absolutely right. I think the, 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 the how do we uh, renegotiate how we mediate trust online is, is a far broader conversation. I acknowledge that there's dimensions to this from the digital governance space that I, I, am, I am somewhat missing, uh, that, that I think uh, through these comments I think is, is, is quite helpful, uh, but uh, it, it's nonetheless a space that the argument is, is it's demonstrated that it's possible to do it in a safe way. Uh, why can't we expand that or why are we taking a particular interpretation of, of, of when we are and aren't able to, to, to mediate trust and particularly around some of those jurisdictional issues uh, and, and some of the competition of, of competing interests uh, around uh, those, 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 those issues. But, uh, but thank you, uh, Rob, and I'm looking forward to...
Lori? Yeah, I'm just chiming in quickly, but in response to your comments and, and your paper generally, you could easily walk into a brick and mortar drugstore and get a counterfeit drug. Okay, that's a fact. So some of these issues about trust exist online and offline, and equally, maybe it's a little harder because those supply chains have been a little more tightly um, uh, regulated. But they're there. Counterfeits are in the real world too, and so I, you know, many of you understand that I, I represent interests um, related to brands and branding. But this is what branding is about: building trust and this idea of creating public and par private partnerships to catch up to where regulate pure governmental regulation just can't get too fast enough I think is a really good thing and I would say that this is a sliver of a greater problem when we're talking about um, counterfeits in general not so to Pat's point this is more about whitelisting and identifying where the good guys are which those in my community would totally support but the, the the opposite idea of making sure we get the bad guys out I think also deserves legitimate talk and my colleague from the EFF is not here, but, but you hear this, or I, we hear this a lot about shadow regulation. And I want to say I actually object to that term because I don't think there's anything shadow about voluntary programs that engender trust on the internet that are being actively pursued between the public and private sectors. I think that's vital to building trust. It's about like, it's not about opacity at all. And I would really like to see the community steering away from language like shadow regulation. Thank you, Lori. In fact, the, the, the language that, uh, uh, this, that our... This no, session is called shadow regulation, I believe. Uh, and, uh, that quite, could well be. Yeah, <laughs> Actually, and, that and was I an do early, have a problem. An early submission, indeed. Yeah, I'm sorry to say I, but I will speak on I on no. my behalf. But it's a loaded term. It is. And it doesn't speak well for what you're trying to do, particularly from those who represent private sector interests. Thank you very much, um, and fully take that on and appreciate it. Uh, we filed that a long time ago, and unfortunately we didn't make any changes, but really the, the title, the, the term that we're using is hybrid uh, regime, hy hybrid regulation regimes uh, that Ari has pointed out. So he, I've been made aware of that, but thank you very much. Um, Gabe, I know you would like to say two words, and we're seven minutes and a half overdue, so if you could make I'm it short, gonna, thank you. I mean, I'd love to talk to you about why the phrase shadow regulations might not, apply, might not apply to, um, to some public private partnerships, but there are public private partnerships where each party brings a commercial advantage to what the result is of that partnership, which can massively disadvantage con consumers. So I happen to be the founder of one of the for um, not, not a co-founder, co I should say, of phar pharmacychecker.com, which is one of the four uh, non-governmental -go 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 credentialing agencies. And I just want to speak to why this is not a North American problem and the, why the uh, IGF should be paying attention to the dot pharmacy GTLD and how it could impact drug pricing um, efforts of drug companies over time. One, and just to speak very clearly, um, the NABP's application to obtain dot pharmacy was funded by, at a minimum, five pharmaceutical companies for a minimum of three hundred and sixty thousand dot 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 dollars and. Like Aria said, the NABP looks to the most exclusionary um, in, in, internet property maximizing laws in the US to then, to then su supplant that onto the dot pharmacy space. So what you have is the drug companies, uh, in my, my opinion, able to obtain the regulatory capture that they've done in the United States onto the internet. And so just to quickly end this, because we're over, where I live, there's tens of millions of Americans not filling prescriptions uh, every, 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 every year. The good international online pharmacies are a lifeline of affordable med med medicines, and yet many of them are on the
NABP's not recommended list where they end up scaring people away from medicine they might otherwise be able to afford. And I just wanted to state the kind of harm that can come from those pharmaceutically in this uh, ph pharmaceutical in 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 industry internet funded programs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gabe. Appreciate your intervention, Laurie. I think that just, Aria wanted to respond to some comments. Just a couple. Made. Again, I think it's it's. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm really appreciating all the comments, and I'm, I, I take all these I think uh, critiques um, I think uh, seriously. Um, uh, I I will clarify that I don't use the term shadow regulation in my paper, as as Ron mentioned. Uh, that the term or, or that the. the the actual session was was submitted in the summer, um, but where I would still, I'm, I'm a little more cautious in the paper in the terms I use about hybrid regulatory regimes and the concept of beyond regulation, but where I um, will um, sort of argue where there is some salience to, 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 even if it were to be framed that way is, again, not for particular actors that are trying to get bad actors out of the way, but where are there non-legally binding or private agreements that go above and beyond what is uh, allowed or, or, or not allowed? So for example, in, in, in modifying terms and service agreements, for example, uh, and uh, I, I per absolutely agree with you of, of sort of the shift towards the whitelist is, is, is an approach that, that ought to work, but again, who is whitelisted and under what criteria, right? Right. That's that's exactly right, and that's my point. I mean, these are age-old market problems. Online creates exponential instances of the problems, but the problems have existed since day one. And that's where I do feel that, you know, in my field, intellectual property and those who practice it, where, quite frankly, we get, we get a lot heaped on us about what we're trying to do inside the space. But much of that work is predicated on consumer protection, making sure that the end user is getting what the end user is supposed to get. Now, what happens in the middle, that's what we're all here to figure out. So I wouldn't, you know, like I said, I would really try to keep toward language that talks about the positive aspects of our partnerships and not having us come up against each other because from a civil society, private sector and government perspective, we do, this is one area we do all agree, right? Whether we're trying to stop the bad guys or shed light on the good guys or you know, get the right medicines to the right people at the right times, this, this is a good microscopic example. But you can extend that out to almost any industry right now where, you, where counterfeiting generally online is a bad thing. And whatever initiatives we can use to, to get things better and right, we ought to be doing and not casting you know, doubt over any sort of conversations by using terms like shadow regulation. That's sort of where I'm coming down. And, and that's in part why the conclusions around having a, a uh, where can these different stakeholders with interest, do we have forums where these stakeholders can, can engage and around the norms? Because uh, there are, as you say, uh, opportun there, there, are, there is, in, in a sense, a shared concern for, for consumer safety, consumer rights, public health. Uh, where, is, where, where do forums exist for engaging those? And the conversations that, that precede the way Klaus said are, are driven by those particular norms uh, and, and the practices and the, 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 the types of approaches, regulatory approaches, uh, reflect those norms right. and, and those stakeholders. And then I'm going to add on to that to Ron's comments and Klaus's comments and others. There are established ways of doing this inside using intellectual property rights. And you have that trust symbol, right? That icon that you're using, that's there and developed based on international trademark law, the certification mark or collective mark, whatever, however it's being. Um, however it was set up legally. But the point is there are legal mechanisms, there are ways to monitor bad acts and good acts on the internet. There are tools that very experienced IP practitioners have, whether they're lawyers, agents, law enforcement. It's, it's there and it's there to help. And I think that's an, an important to talk about within this conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of you who contributed and stayed 14 minutes longer than we should have concluded. But uh, I hope you all felt this was an important session and something to, uh, to engage with uh, Dr. Ahmad on. I would just say one, uh, one uh, word to the wise is on uh, Thursday uh, at 11.45 to 13.15 in Sala Ropa, we will have a, a deeper session with panelists, uh, as uh, Aria mentioned earlier, such as Dr. Olafui from Nigeria, We'll talk more about the Global South issues and issues about uh, around this topic. So you're all more than welcome to uh, join us for that. And thank you again for coming today. Very much appreciated.